So, I'm in London. It's, it's 8 p.m. And I'm at Tate Modern. And you are not here with me. Physically. I'm going to do a dance now that lasts for about 18 minutes. I mean, it's a terrible ending. 
part of the article. It doesn't have like any special importance or anything. It's a little cunning kind of actually. I kind of like that. I mean, I think I can kind of use this attitude more. Like, I don't know if this relates, but sometimes, right before I go to bed, I feel like, I don't know, like I have to have a really awesome last moment before I fall asleep, like the perfect last moment. You know, I can't just watch some, something stupid on the internet and then go straight to bed. Like first, I have to read a few pages of my great book and then turn off the lights. Like I have this classical image of how a good day is supposed to end. And I think it's kind of stupid, like, I think I'm asleep over it actually. I mean, yeah. Yeah, like, I need to be more like, what if the end of my day doesn't matter so much? Like, I don't need to give it so much specialness.
something kind of familiar, but at the same time, like, completely unknown, actually, you know? Totally unfamiliar somehow. But I guess in some ways it's kind of like that Hitchcock ending. Like, there was that tense moment of the gunshot, but then that little stupid romantic scene after that kind of softens it a bit. Yeah, again, it's the sense of an ending that actually feels like an opening. It's like, it's like the book opens on into my life. Like, you know, it's a, like, it's a frame, and the book is a frame. And when I finish reading the book, there's something outside the frame, it's like, the frame dissolves, the frame of the book dissolves. And it, it, it. You know? When I was younger, my family was in the Seventh day Adventist Church, and they had this crazy history that, like in the 1800s or something, uh, they predicted the end of the world. And everyone was really excited about it. Like they, they were excited that God's kingdom would come, but they were like really specific. I don't know, it's like an unintentional 
here, I'll show you. It goes like this. She held out her trembling hand to Kay and had him sit down beside her. She spoke with great difficulty. It was difficult to understand her, but what she said. That's it. I mean, I mean yeah. yeah. I, I guess, guess I'm not so, so sure about it, you know, as an ending all by itself. It's maybe, maybe lacking, but when you come to it at the end of the book, there's something, you know, funny about it. And kind of jolting, but still. What do I want to say? I mean, I never came across an ending. Hi and welcome to the performance room where I have great pleasure to introduce Daniel Linehan who's the choreographer who made the piece tonight and we're going to be able to answer your questions directly uh, if you send them in through Google+, Twitter, uh, Facebook or YouTube and I've actually got a couple here already and something that I asked you straight away about the piece actually is what the text, came, I mean what was the text? Yes. Um, Tom Jackson in Brooklyn has said I wish I could have been part of that conversation. Where does the dialogue come from? Is it real? Um, well, the dialogue is real in the sense that it came from an actual uh, conversation I had, but it was a conversation with myself in a way. So I have this practice of doing self-interviews where I, I speak to myself almost like a, a divided self in a way where I'm both the interviewer and the interviewee. Um, and so, yeah, in this particular uh, text came from a, a recording of one of those um, self-interviews and the, uh, the, the kind of pacing of the text was then transcribed into the text on the screen so that the pacing of the speech uh -huh. uh, matches the same timing as the pacing of when the words appear on the screen. Is that something you've done before to generate work or uh, no, is this a is new direction? The first time, yeah. yeah. But using text, I mean. Oh yeah, I've used text in other pieces before. But yeah, usually it starts from writing the text down or uh, sometimes trying out. Yeah, usually it starts from writing it down. Um, so this time it was different that nothing mm. was written down until it was written down in the, in the screen. Mm. And um, there's a question from Annie Habra Abrahams in Montpellier asking if there's any relationship to sign language. Mm -hmm. I guess there was this very nice interplay, I thought, between your speaking the words, seeing the figures of the words written and the movements yeah. of your body. There Is wasn't a direct uh, relationship with sign language, although I was thinking a bit that the, also that the whole body could be expressive, so not just the arms and hands and face, but also that a, a gesture of a leg could also be expressive. But part of what we are expressing is the rhythm of the speech itself. Mm. So it's not that each word has a correlate in the kind of movement we do, but it's more the rhythm of how that word is said uh, influences the rhythm of our movement. So that later on, if it's the same word, but in a different rhythm, then, then it's a different movement. Uh -huh. um, so it's, not, it's, uh, it's a bit thinking that the movement comes more from the speech than, than the written word. Um, okay, like it's that's interesting. In, in the written the word, intonation and pattern yes. more than... Because in, in speech there's different pitch that has a different meaning and there's different uh, rate of change uh, that also influences kind of how the, how the conversation is going and how the meaning of the speech is received. So it was more dealing a bit with this tempo and intonation, translating that into movement, mm -hmm. rather than um, that a certain word would have a specific uh, sign or movement that would go along with it. And did you have some kind of vocabulary of movement or gestures established in advance? 
No, it's kind of, I, uh, I developed the, vocab the movement vocabulary by starting from the beginning. I started correlating the movement to the rhythm of the speech and also sometimes doing counterpoints. So when there's silent in the speech, that's mm. when I would move. And then when I start speaking, then I, I do stillness. So the relationship was a bit fluid in terms of how, mm. how I would counterpoint the movement and the speech. Um, but there wasn't a vocabulary determined in advance. It's more that the vocabulary was kind of self-defined as yeah. I kept producing it. And once I had produced 30 seconds of material, then the next 30 seconds kind of made sense in relation to the mm. first 30 seconds and so on. So there wasn't like a code of a meta message that you're broadcasting no. <laughs> out there to somebody who could decipher it. No. <laughs> oh, but it's a beautiful relationship, I thought. Um, there's a question from Ernesto in Miami, in the USA. Would you consider this a global artwork on, a, uh, on account of it kind of being distributed worldwide by the web? I guess that's a broader question, really, of what it means to make a work broadcast in this way, yeah. which is not how you usually work. No, I'm much more used to, so I'm a choreographer making work for the stage or for a studio, and so I'm much more used to having the audience in the room when the mm. event takes place. And so it was, it was a bit bizarre to know that there's a lot of people out there watching, but I yeah. have no yes. uh, direct relationship with them. That they're, they're, I somehow feel that they're in the room, but virtually not. I don't feel their physical presence as much. Um, but in relation to this question, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I imagine that the fact that different people can watch this live performance in very different geographical locations at the, mm. at the exact same moment, uh, somehow makes it so that the audience can be larger than just um, performing in a certain city and having people from that city come to that particular yeah. performance, but that there can, there can be a, yeah, a larger global audience. Mm. Um, but do you miss that localness and reciprocity? Does that feel strange when you're doing working um, like this? It's, maybe it's too early to say because you've just done it. Yeah, I, I miss it, but it, I w I'm also somehow happy <laughs> to try this <laughs> other experience. I mean, actually, I feel a bit, I mean, I had a bit of stress, but I feel a bit more calm to not have, to not see the people directly, but to yeah. um, kind of know in the abstract that they're out there, but I, I don't, uh, I don't feel their presence, so I felt a bit more calm in the performance of it. I mean, I guess um, we were thinking originally in setting this up about artists, video artists and performance artists mm -hmm. using the studio straight to camera. Mm -hmm. And that was a kind of feedback loop that artists were often using originally to check or like look at their own work, mm -hmm. which you were able to do here too. Yeah. I know. So there's almost a more interior kind of contemplative way of working maybe than the normal performance mode. I don't know. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I've, especially when I perform in my own work, I feel like I can never see it from the outside. Mm. I can record a video of it, but the actual work is in this yeah. direct relationship with the audience in the room, so there's something always missing. Whereas here, I know I'm building it for this, uh, for this live webcast, so somehow I feel like I can already see what the work will be uh, yeah. from the outside, even mm. as I'm inside the work itself, which is, which is new for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, um, there's a sorry, question from Celine Goldman in Oxford, who asked, did you start your work with the space in mind first or the other way around? Like, is this a piece of dance you would have made or are making, regardless of the space, the situation? Uh, well, I mean, the original idea behind this work, I, I had started working on it before I knew about this mm. opportunity in performance room. So at first I conceived it for the stage, but then once I knew about this, uh, that, that I would be doing a, a performance for a performance room, I thought that it, um, yeah, that this, my conception of the piece made a lot of sense in, in this space. I mean, we don't need a lot of space and we have this kind of direct uh, relationship with the, uh, uh, this focal point downstage because we're reading the text. So mm -hmm. somehow this uh, focal point towards the text and towards the camera would kind of establish um, a direct link with the with the viewer who's kind of looking on the other side of that. And it's and I felt like it somehow had a resemblance to like a, a testimonial on YouTube or something where people yeah. are speaking directly to the camera, but but um, twisted in a different way where the 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 speech is also accompanied by this movement and that it's mm. also doubled by another person. 
And your whole theme of the piece was about endings. Yes. Um, in lots of different ways. Could you say something about why you chose that as a, as a starting point? Yeah, I mean, it's partly that in dance, uh, I'm, when I'm making a dance, I'm not usually working with a kind of narrative that would have a plot that leads towards an ending. So it's always a bit mysterious, like, why is it continuing and why and when should it end? Um, so I was, I was interested to kind of call into mind the ending right away from the beginning so that to feel like something's leading towards something, but, uh, and I imagine that there's kind of, with talking about endings, that there's anticipation about what the ending will be. Mm. Um, so I feel like because it's a time-based work, it kind of uh, already has this direction forward in time. And I mean, I was also thinking about end in terms of the ends and the means, uh -huh. um, and that the speech is usually used as a means for it to reach the end of communication. Mm. But then in the process of working, I was at first just using the speech as a means for something different, as a means for creating uh, a movement vocabulary. So I was thinking of also kind of um, things that have normally a certain end to use them for a different end. Uh -huh. And it was kind of a play on words, That's but nice. it related to the, my relationship with the end and the goal and, and what things are moving towards mm. and kind of also re uh, twisting that around a bit and exactly because the end kept becoming part of the process in the way you kept staging a kind of fake ending and then working through it yes. or or rather a pause where we thought it might be the end and it wasn't yes yeah oh, that's great um there's a question uh from zach keys in london how did you collaborate with the dancer Anne-Lene? um well do you work together often Yes, we've worked yeah. together in, in two or three other processes before. This particular process, um, I started already with the vocabulary. Um, I had built it by myself, so then I was teaching it to her and we were making some changes and some uh, uh, um, refinements to what we were doing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I come with the material and the ideas, but then also during the process it's a dialogue. Um, and we both stand outside and watch the video and give our opinions mm -hmm. uh, about what we're seeing. And, and so, uh, yeah, it was also a process of, of dialogue with her. Mm -hmm. And also in, in other processes, I usually work in this way with the dancers, that it's not only dictating what they should do, but yeah. letting there be a conversation about uh, what's going to happen. And then you're in the work too, so I guess her view on the work is also important, like you said, as yeah. a kind of outside view. Yeah, I mean, I can't, somehow I can't be objective when I see myself on the mm. screen, so <laughs> she helps me to understand what, uh, what, uh, what I'm doing. And yeah. yeah. I mean, that was nice too, the mirroring. I really mm -hmm. liked the whole synchronicity of it, but that was kind of in and out of sync at certain points. Yeah. I it's mean, quite pleasing. We felt, uh, we felt like we could give ourselves the freedom to be in sync or not in sync, and it wasn't it's not that that was the, the goal in the end, that we're in perfect unison the whole time, but that we mm. both have this knowledge of this vocabulary and we have the freedom to choose to go along with that mm. or to make tiny adjustments uh, departing from it. But it's interesting, given how you said the conversation was generated, that you didn't choose to kind of mirror yourself more exactly, like have two men, mm -hmm. two of you, <laughs> somehow. Yeah. There were these different ways that the mirroring was also a refraction or space of difference. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from Tom Parkinson about why the conversation focused on, well, asking why did the conversation focus on works of literature? Um, yeah, but we also referenced uh, movies. Referenced and, lots um, of <laughs> Adventists, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Oh yeah, we <laughs> referenced, uh, but it's true, there was three literary references and there's like one film reference, one music reference. Um, I think somehow when I'm making my my work and thinking about endings, it's it's uh, somehow I relate, uh, or some of the endings that have been most striking to me have been in works of literature, especially since you build up for uh, days or weeks of reading something and, and, mm. and it's building towards something, and then the ending can either be satisfying or or unsatisfying. So uh, somehow when I'm thinking about when is it an effective ending, I, my mind maybe tends to go towards literature because. Um, because of that reason, but but yeah, in the work we also reference endings and newspaper article, um, music, a film, uh, the idea of the end of the world. So. I like your thing about the end of the day. 
I needing know. the perfect end of the day before you go to sleep. Yeah. That was <laughs> yeah, somehow that related to, to that. Yeah. Okay, we've just got time for one more question from Reuben Watson King in New York, which is, what's your ideal setting for a performance? Ooh. Um, well. <laughs> this could be a difficult question. I don't think I have an Do ideal. You? Like, I, I really enjoy working in very different spaces and even sometimes doing the same performance. Uh, I mean, one thing that's satisfying about repeating a performance is being able to do it in different spaces and seeing how it feels when you're in a small room and people are close to you and seeing how it feels when you're in a very large mm. hall and people are far away from you. Because also it, it helps the performance evolve and change to have this experience of the same performance in different spaces. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in a proscenium type theater, I guess yeah. it's pretty different than a studio space or a gallery. Yeah, and sometimes I'll, I'll have done the same piece, mm. but have done it in a proscenium stage or, and then transfer it to a studio. And uh, I, I enjoy how, how the piece changes in the different locations. Mm, different formats, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm afraid, well, thank you ever so much yeah, for answering you. the questions and thanks to everybody who submitted them. Um, that is our last performance room for 2013, but we will be back in the uh, beginning of next year. Thank you and thanks, Daniel. Thanks.